Aren't y'all excited to still be in Texas? The blue bonnets are out. The Indian blankets are everywhere. People are taking pictures. It's so pretty here. It's 89 in Vegas. Everybody can't live in the bling bling capital of the world. <laughs> So our victim was last seen by her husband in 1986. Six. Diane Holscher was 39 years old. She was the mother of two children. They come from a very good neighborhood in San Antonio. She owned her own business. She was a designer. She was into high-end furs and high-end clothing. On the surface, it would seem like Diane Holscher had it all. She had a good family. She had money. She had a happy life. And then one day, she was just gone. When Diane was last seen alive, February the 4th, 1986, she was going to Houston to try and sell some high-end fabric from her store. They didn't know where she'd gone, and she was just missing. And they find her remains out here in Waller County on the way to Houston 11 years later. Waller's, what, like three hours away from San Antonio? Two and a half, three hours. Well, that's a long way from home. When a murder case takes place in a lot of different counties, it's up to any one of those law enforcement agencies to take over that case and do something about it. With agencies so busy these days, it's really hard for them to pin down who a case should go to. We keep seeing that in our cold cases when they get left between counties. Everybody's so busy, nobody wants to say it's my case, but you gotta give Waller County credit, they did. Sure. This is gonna be once again, picking up the pieces, talking to everybody all over again, and hoping for some good luck. It has been 16 years and still no answer. Police consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. We're here to meet Lieutenant Heather Owens. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Heather. Nice, Hi. To, meet nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so Hi. much. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. We want to tell you that we uh, give y'all full credit for taking on this case when other agencies could have and didn't. A skeleton was found in our county in 1997. We had no way of identifying the remains at that time. Automatically, the police research their files and any small neighboring counties looking for missing people, looking for any possible homicides of females that were never identified. But since San Antonio is more than 150 miles away and not a neighbor of Waller, they were never presented with Diane as a possible ID for Jane Doe. Then in 2014, the University of North Texas Center for Human Identifications, which keeps a database of missing persons DNA from across Texas, matched DNA from the body found in Waller with DNA from Diane's son that was collected as part of San Antonio PD's missing persons investigation. And they were able to positively ID the remains as being Diane Holscher. That set off a chain of events that leads us to this investigation and a case that's basically 26 years old. Hi, hey, I'm, I'm Heather Brown. Owens. Nice to meet Heather? you. Heather? Okay. Alan Brown has come in to work on this case. He was with the Houston Police Department Homicide Division for 25 years, and he's still in touch with some of the guys that actually worked this case when it was just a missing person case all those years ago. That's a real Texas lawman right there. Right. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Okay, so at that point, the remains are found in your county. They get identified very recently. Once we learned of the DNA match, that's when we started finding out everything about her. What did you have as far as an offense report at that point? Probably not much, not right? Not much, no. So you put all that together, collaborating yes. with San Antonio PD and HPD. Do you put all that together just in the past six months? Yes. Wow, less than that. Less than that, yeah. I just feel that we have a responsibility to the community, and I took an oath, and that means very, very much to me. Good for you. Okay, so why don't y'all start with the beginning of the story. February 13th, 1986, Joseph Holscher Sr. reported his wife, Diane Holscher, missing to San Antonio Police Department. Diane Holscher was a young, beautiful woman in the prime of her life. She was in fashion. She had her own business where she was making custom dresses. Okay, so here's our picture of Diane Helsher. How long have they been married? 10 years. 10 years? 10 years. According to the report. They had little kids. Yes. Joe and Diane had two children, a son who was nine years old and a daughter who was six. According to Joseph Holsher, 
his wife, Diane Holscher, left to go on a business trip around February 4th of 1986 to take her fabrics to Houston in the Dallas area to sell on February 13th, 1986. A briefcase was found in Waller County, we ended up learning, belonged to Diane Holscher. In May of 1986, Diane Holscher's vehicle is located in Houston at the Galleria Mall in the parking lot. Three months after she went missing, Diane's car was found in a mall in Houston where her husband said she was heading. So the question is going to be, did she actually make it to Houston and her car sat in a mall parking lot for three months unnoticed? Or was it placed there sometime later as the killer was trying to cover their tracks? Okay, so as far as our world of suspects, why don't we first start with Joe Helsher Sr. Joe is the one who actually reported Diane missing and he's the one who's been in the middle of this investigation for all these years. He's done a lot of suspicious things. The first thing is he waited more than a week before he ever even reported her missing. He's not concerned about her being missing. He's not concerned about making a report. He didn't follow up to try and find her. Did nothing to check on her. Right. Okay. What else? Sounds like they were having financial problems. Joe and Diane like to enjoy and show off their lavish lifestyle, but the truth behind the story is that they did have a lot of financial troubles, and a lot of people often wondered where Joe's money came from. What about the life insurance policy? $500,000, that's all we need to write up there. That's the yep, $500,000. Just two years after Diane's disappearance, Joe had her declared legally dead and collected on a $500,000 life insurance policy. This certainly seems suspicious, but on the other hand, maybe he needed money after Diane went missing. If you're a single parent raising kids, you're going to collect on a policy if you have it. So Joe Helsher is not the suspect. Um, an unknown guy is. We also want to consider the possibility that while Diane was traveling to Houston for business, she could have been abducted by a stranger or possibly killed in a botched robbery. She was just a random victim of violence. Okay. After all, the location of her body, the briefcase, and her car could have been consistent with her being killed while on the road. Diane's mother, brother, and sister-in-law have traveled here from Florida and Alabama for our investigation. Just from talking with you guys, I know how much of a wonderful person she truly was. Thank you so much. We appreciate it very much. It's been like 29 years. We wanted to come on out here because mom wanted closure, and hopefully we can get something. Don, why don't you start by telling us some things about your sister? She was a great gal. She loved people. She was kind. She was considerate. She had a great heart. Diane was a beautiful seamstress, just beautiful. She made all her prom dresses and everything. So I just didn't expect to go through all this. But they say I'm strong and I can do it, so. Because you have to. She didn't deserve to have to go this way. I just can't feel there's a closure yet. Just seems like she wants to come and say, hi, Mom, how are you? I'd like to see her, but I can't. But I will someday. Why don't you talk about Joe and their marriage and, and their situation? I guess I had my opinion of him right away. I just thought he was pretty smooth and I never knew what he was doing. I don't know where the money came. But as long as my daughter was happy and loved him and everything, it was okay. One thing that we thought was weird about this whole thing is that the only way mom found out that Diane was missing was that she was calling one of the children to wish her happy birthday. And then Joe got on the phone and said, by the way, Diane's been missing for four weeks. It's just kind of weird. Joe got on the phone and said, by the way, Diane's been missing for four weeks. It's just kind of weird. We are investigating the murder of Diane Holscher, who disappeared in 1986 and who was found dead 11 years later. We're trying to determine if her husband, Joe Holscher, was involved in her disappearance and death, or if it was just simply a random act of violence. He got his money from Etna. I don't know. Did Joe ever admit to you that he had money problems? No. Okay. He told his mother, because his mother called Jim and I, and she said, well, he wants a bunch of money from me. 
that summer after she was missing, I was out in San Antonio, and I went down to the police department because we hadn't had any contact with Joe. And just to find out where things were, at, at that time, they had reason to believe that Diane did not want to be found. There had been some financial problems, bad checks written. They just were kind of backing off because they just felt that she wanted to be missing but she was not the kind of person to ever go off and leave her children. That was the one thing that did not make sense. For years, we'd think at Christmas or birthdays or whatever, maybe we'll hear from Diane. Uh, but then we never did. And so when Diane's remains had been found and identified, it was a huge shock. We hope that we can give you some answers and some good news, and we're gonna go and start trying to find people and talk to them. We appreciate it very much what you're doing. No. What you're Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Since we don't know where Diane was killed, we have to try and retrace the steps her killer took disposing of the evidence in order to try and figure out if this was a random killer or if her husband was the killer. Okay, so first we're going to go see where the briefcase was. There are three key locations in this case. The roadside where her briefcase was found on February 13th, the mall parking lot where her car was found three months later, and the field where her body was found 11 years after that. So just kind of a lot of rural area, huh? Yes. Your favorite girlfriend, country road. Exactly. All right. That's an old field access gate. It's an old field road that runs west off of 2855. The drainage ditch runs north and south across That's the good. road. Recovered property is on the south side and in the water. Right down there? In the water. Okay. It's right there. The briefcase had really nothing of value in it except for Diane's driver's license. Or here, right here, right here. Right here. What a good place to dump it. It's strange that this is the only item of Diane's that was recovered. It almost looks staged, like someone wanted the police to know that the briefcase belonged to Diane Holscher. So they put her driver's license in it. Regardless, it doesn't seem like something a random killer would do. Three months after Diane was last seen in her home in San Antonio, Diane's car was found at the Galleria Mall in Houston, Texas. If Diane made it all the way to Houston and checked into a hotel at the Galleria Mall, then it makes total sense that her car would be parked there. Got Nima Marcus this way, her car would have been pretty much directly in front of us. The mall security, you know, part of their job typically is to check the abandoned vehicles. If security keeps seeing their car, they will let at, at the least have it just towed off. We don't have any statements from mall security at the time, but it seems next to impossible that her car could sit abandoned in the mall for three months and nobody notice. I'm never going to buy in the fact that that car has been here for three months. Never going to buy that. I agree. If Diane's car was moved to the mall parking lot after she went missing, it's just another strike against the theory that her death was a random act of violence. After all, wouldn't a random killer want to ditch her car right away? Not to hold on to it, only to place it in a mall parking lot months later? Have a seat. Thanks for coming all this way, Gene. Oh, you're welcome. Gene Hensley was a Houston police detective who responded to the abandoned vehicle at the Galleria Mall. Back in 86, we received a recovered vehicle report. So we got over there, and there was a vehicle there in the parking lot. HPD notified Joe Holscher that his missing wife's vehicle had been recovered, and he traveled from San Antonio to meet detectives on the scene. He was quite emotional at the time, on the verge of crying. And he said that his wife had come to Houston to uh, do some business uh, regarding her dress shop. Joe says that he helped Diane load several rolls of fabric into her Jeep before she left, but neither fabric nor any luggage was ever found in the car. Did a random killer steal these items or were they never put there to begin with? Said he'd talk to her why she was here. And he said that he'd only talked to her one time after she left San Antonio? That's right. Did he tell you at all where she might be staying or anything like that? Didn't say. Okay. Joe initially told police that he did not talk to Diane after she left. Then he told police that he did speak to her once, but he didn't know where she was staying. I appreciate it. Well, thanks. Thanks to see lot. you again. We're going to go see the old farm where the skeletal remains were found. She was found 11 years after she went missing. 
She was 75 feet from the road, which would be 25 yards. She would have been like right in this area here. And the fact that the body was found 11 years after the day of her disappearance creates a lot of hurdles for you because there's not much evidence. There's nothing left but skeletal remains. So you have no way to establish bruising or any wounds. There were multiple injuries and defects on the skull, but it's impossible to tell if those were the cause of death or if it's just from the remains being in nature for 11 years. Y'all grew up out here. Y'all talk about how busy it was 28 years ago at nighttime in this area. I mean, there wouldn't have been anybody out here. Traffic was few and far between. This was a, just a little farm market road. It's all it was. And we were in sticks. One thing about how easy it would be to whoop in right there, run over there, dump or get back in your car and leave and head back to the big city. Fast and easy. Look how brushy this is. Look how easy it would be to have a body hidden in there for a long time and nobody could see it. It's all brushed. This is way cleared compared to the picture. Hiding the body in a place like this was the smartest thing the killer could have ever done. It was 11 years before her body was found, and it was 17 years before she could ever even be identified. Because whether it was Joe Holscher or some random killer who murdered Diane, after 28 years, a lot of the little details that will help you with a case like this are long gone. In 1986, Diane Holscher went missing from her home in San Antonio, leaving behind her children, her husband, and a whole lot of questions. She was discovered 11 years later in Waller County, and when those remains were identified in 2014, the Waller County Sheriff's Department began their investigation, trying to determine if her death was a random act of violence because she was traveling to business or if her husband, Joe Holscher, was involved. All right, guys, this is Detective Lopez, the retired Detective San Antonio Detective Police Department. Department. Detective Lopez right. was a cop for 32 years, so probably worked much. thousands of cases in his career. He retired 23 years ago. Does that case stand out in your mind? Yes, so yes, it does. Yet he still remembers Joe Holster. Okay, when is the first time when he tells you about this trip to Houston? She had gone on business. Okay. He was very evasive. When, when I first started working on it, uh, it seemed like it was a scam. They had filed for bankruptcy a couple of times. So there really was a bankruptcy? Because we're not clear yes, on that. Yes, that's why we figured she's just hiding until he could collect the half a million. And, and then be back in the picture. Right. So your interpretation at the beginning was that it was a scam on both their parts. They left the satchel there with just her driver's license. Like, like he wanted us to know that she was missing, right. you know. It was too obvious. Okay. The thing about this guy is that whenever you ask him a question, he would start crying so he wouldn't have to answer you. Right. That, that was the way out of everything. So it didn't seem genuine to you. It's just like he was avoiding the whole question right. and answer. No, he was. You specifically asked him for the names of some of her friends. And what did he do when you did that? Starts crying. How unusual is it that he does not want any of you to contact her parents? How many people make that kind of request? That seems odd. You don't want to tell her own mom and dad? Yeah. That's crazy. It made sense to me if it was just a scam to get that half million dollars. I always thought she was alive at the time. When you're talking to him, mm -hmm. did he appear worried? No, and again, I'm saying the same thing over and over. That's he starts okay. crying. Okay. That way he doesn't have to tell you anything. It's a shame that Joe and Diane's financial history and Joe's evasiveness led investigators to believe that all of this was a scam that Diane might have been involved with. But it makes perfect sense when you realize that even though Joe and Diane appeared to be affluent, they really had secret financial issues that no one knew about. When I was working for her, she took me to meet a gentleman. His name was Don. And he had like a very exclusive hat shop in Manhattan. And she was buying hats from him. It was just a few weeks after we had come back from New York that Don was calling the shop and she wouldn't take his calls. He told me, young lady, I would suggest you look for another job because she's not paying her bills. Okay. Why was the business doing so poorly? The fashion business is really difficult. Sure. And when she opened her shop, it was sort of like a very upscale shop. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a little extravagant. For San Antonio? For San Antonio. Honestly, we were not making a lot of dresses. Did you know her to do any business in Houston back then? No. So if someone told us that when she disappeared, she was going to Houston to sell numerous rolls of expensive fabric 
do you remember her having that kind of excess inventory? Does that sound like something she would do? There's no way she could have had enough money in fabric in her car to save her business. Our witness thinks it would be unlikely for Diane to make this business trip. That creates questions in Joel Holster's story that we need to find answers to. Hey, look who I found wandering the hall. <laughs> Larry Ott was a homicide detective back in Houston during the time this investigation was going on. And actually, Larry Ott, when I went to the Houston Homicide Division, was one of the guys who taught me how to be a homicide detective. So Larry Ott was assigned the case along with his partner back at that time. Okay, so Larry, just start from the beginning and tell us everything that you did and your involvement with the case. Well, according to uh, her husband, she was uh, coming to Houston to sell fabric. He told us that she normally stayed in hotels around the Galleria. So my partner and I, during that time, checked all the hotels in that area and no record of her ever checking into any hotel. No records of her? No, never heard of her. We checked every fabric place uh, in that area. No one had ever heard of her and nothing about selling fabric. Do you remember if they said whether or not they would buy fabric from an individual like that off the street? No, they said they would not. That's important. Because they didn't know the quality okay. of the fabric. Okay, so look up here on the board. We now have Larry who can say the, the fabric story that he gives, Larry is taken care of and eliminated. And the hotel explanation that we have so far, Larry eliminated. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a big Very piece well, of the puzzle. Uh, It now appears that Diane's trip to Houston may not ever have happened. So now Alan and Lieutenant Owens are gonna talk to a neighbor of the Holshers who gave Joe a ride to Houston after Diane's car showed up three months later. For the ride down, what's your personal interpretation of Joe's demeanor? It was like he was somewhat emotionless. It was kind of strange reaction because I was expecting him to be a little bit more emotional about the whole thing. Now, when you drive down there, how do you know exactly where to go? There was a hotel in the gallery. So he specifically wanted to look in the hotel area? Yeah. What did he tell you exactly? She got a room. Supposedly, somebody from the hotel somehow told Joe or she was seen leaving with some guy. Then she just disappeared. Really? Joe Holster never told the police that. Would it shock you if I told you that she had never registered at that hotel? Wow. Wow. He said that she checked into a hotel in the Galleria. Right, and that's why and her that vehicle was there. Yeah. Initially, Joe says he never talked to Diane the entire time she was gone, but then he told police he ended up talking to her once. Now we hear from Joe's neighbor, and not only does he know where she's staying, but that she's been seen with some guy and never told the police. Joe's statements are all over the place, which makes it suspicious for us. In 1986, Diane Holsher disappeared and was never heard from again. Her remains were found in 1997, and she wasn't identified until 2014. That turned an old missing person case into a murder investigation. Although we cannot yet rule out she was killed by some unknown assailant, evidence has begun pointing to Joe Holsher, Diane's husband, our main suspect. So we need to look into Diane's personal life to get a better idea of their marriage. How long did you know Diane? Us. Several years. Actually, she was my only friend, really, when I lived here in San Antonio. So I had been in her home, and she had little ones. So when she came up missing, that's the first thing I said. You know, she just wouldn't take off, because she, she loved those kids. How about her relationship with Joe? I mean, if y'all were friends, had lunch a lot together. I only met him a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing I have in the back of my mind is I don't think she knew what he did for a job. They've been married a while, too. Mm-hmm. Do you find that odd? Yeah. It's just my gut feeling maybe she wasn't happy. Like she wasn't happy as a person in her relationship? Yeah, there was something back there that was always that she did, she just held back. We are calling because we wanted to talk to you about Diane. Jeff Davis is one of Diane's other brothers. Our hope is that he might be able to shed some light on her life back then. Do you want to start with the last time that you spoke with your sister, Diane? We were talking, and um, she said that Joe was having psychological problems, and then all of a sudden she couldn't talk anymore. So, um, you know, I'm assuming he walked into the room 
and then we just kind of cut off the conversation. And that was the last time I spoke with her. And that was approximately how long before? A week or so, maybe. It was very close to when she was missing. OK. I'm really, really glad that you did take the time to sit down and talk with us. Sounds great. Thanks All right. Thanks, Jeff. Bye. Bye. Look what I just found. Mr. Holscher filed for divorce from Diane October 13th of 1982. Think about this for a minute. They're really not getting along. Things are going bad, so he goes to file. This is brand new information that puts the 500000 that Joe collected on Diane's life insurance in a new light. He gets the life insurance owner in 83 sometime. That's huge. It turns out that the policy Joe collected on was taken out right around the time he petitioned for a divorce, just a few years before she went missing. We've also discovered that the Holshers only had a life insurance policy for Diane the owner of a small failing business, yet didn't have one for Joe. If the policy was less than two years old, they're going to do an extensive investigation because that's your exclusion period on most life policies. But Joe knows that. He's going to wait right. long enough He's to get past that long home. Enough. Diane disappeared two years and six months after the policy was purchased, making it easier for Joe to collect. You get to keep the house, the cars, the bank account. You get to keep your kids. Yeah, there's no fighting over anything when one of you is gone. You get it all. So is it possible that Joe and Diane had a troubled marriage and rather than get a divorce, Joe's solution was to take out a big life insurance policy on Diane and lay in wait? With so much suspicion around Joe Holscher, Lieutenant Heather Owens interviewed one of Joe's exes to see whether she can remember anything regarding whether or not Joe's even capable of murder. She tried to be nice about what she was saying and then that's whenever I started asking the harder questions. She never touched base on any domestic violence until I finally asked her specifically. Was there any type of domestic violence in your relationship? Well, there was not any ongoing domestic violence. What do you mean by that? The thing that happened that made us split was one night I was sleeping and all of a sudden, he was on top of me and choking me. Of course, we weren't getting along. We were arguing, but violently arguing. Nothing was ever thrown. He never had hit me or pushed me or anything like that. But he made bruises big enough. On, I mean, I thought I was gone because he's a very large man. So you were literally asleep. I was on the To him choking. Yes, yes. It was a while. Of course, it could have been a second, but it seemed like a while. I said something to him. Somehow I managed to say something, and he just kind of like crumpled. And he said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So I just calmed him down and said, look, I understand. Everybody gets upset. And then as soon as he left for work, that was it. Got a restraining order. And it went back to him again. She said that she didn't even know how she was able to scream his name out to get him to stop. Oh, my God. After interviewing witnesses and collecting evidence, it's time for us to talk to Joe's son, whom we've held off on talking to before now because he's still close to his dad. What's the last memory you have of your mom? It was very close to when she left. I don't actually remember saying goodbye to her. Okay. She sat my sister and I down and said, you know, I'm going to sell the business and I'm doing it because I want to spend more time with you guys. Yeah. I just wanted you guys to know I'm going to be leaving, but I'll be coming back. Joe's son tells us that his mom did go on a business trip to Houston, but you have to remember he was only 10 years old. So does he remember that or has he been told that his whole life? Whenever she traveled, they would talk every night. The reason I knew something was wrong is because my dad said, oh, well, you know, your, your mom had, is, is late and, you know, I was pestering him, like, what's the deal with that? He's like, well, you know, I don't know. She has a call and sometimes she does that. And I remember thinking, well, that's crap. What is your dad's first best explanation of what happened. He just laid it out one day. He was like, look, I don't know what's going on. We did everything we can. I've hired people. Who did you say he hired, <clears throat> Mr. Hosher? Uh, just some detectives or something. Okay, so he actually hired his own detectives. Right. Your understanding is they helped out. I guess at some point they tried to retrace her route that she might have taken. Okay, they retraced her route. And 
they were the ones who located the vehicle. Okay, and you you probably never talked to a detective, so no. you heard they found the car from whom? Uh, my dad. Remember something about blood? That came later when I was kind of um, pushing him, and he said that, yeah, there was blood in the car, and he wasn't sure exactly how much, but... I and that, that's from your dad, not the detectives, right? Right. Since so many of Joe's son's memories seemed to come from what he was told all during his childhood, I asked him specifically about those rolls of fabric that his dad told him he loaded into her car that weekend. Hey, that's something I was told a, a long time later. Apparently somebody was trying to sell fabric in New York. Somebody went in to get it appraised. But how would it be identifiable? How would the people in New York know enough about this fabric to pay attention and that word to get all the way down here to San Antonio? The fabric in question, as I understand it, was the Swarovski fabric. Okay. It actually had crystals sewn into it. And all of that stuff was registered with Swarovski too, so they would have been able to call and say, hey, what's going on with this? Okay, so this registration and this fancy fabric and the story about what happened in New York, you learn all of that from today. Okay. Joe Holscher never told the police that the rolls of fabric Diane supposedly took to Houston turned up in New York City when someone tried to sell them. So either it didn't happen or Joe's keeping this very important piece of evidence to himself for some unknown reason. Uh, he really doesn't like talking about any of this. Okay. Is your dad a crier? Not really. How would you best describe their marriage? I believe that they were the loves of each other's lives. Do you think they ever gave any consideration to divorce? He's pretty devout, so I think that would have been difficult for them. Joe's son's memory of his parents' marriage just doesn't meet the facts. So Quentin showed him the divorce petition that his dad filed on his mom all those years ago. Did you know that? No, I didn't know it had gotten that bad. It was filed um, October 13th of 82. Because you have to remember, you're a victim. You're a little boy who lost your mom. To me, this is a miracle. Okay, because I didn't think we were ever going to get these answers. I never thought we were going to be able to get my mother very home. What if it turns out to be bad news? I respect the truth a great deal. Um, it's, it's a guiding principle for me. And I would rather know the truth than not know the truth under pretty much any circumstance. With more and more factors now pointing toward Joe Holscher, it's time for us to talk to him. We interviewed him for a little over four hours. The problem was, if you asked him a pointed question, he would start like he's going to answer the question, never answer it, and he'd go way off into right field. Alan, being a great interviewer that he is, starts trying to reel him back in, and he goes, Take a deep breath. I'm not done. He called me by my first name and he'd go, take a breath, Alan. Take a breath. The thing that infuriated me the most was he claims that he told Diane's family immediately when she went missing. We tried to pin him down. Is it a week, a month? He goes, oh, no, no, no. He said it was just a couple of days. Joe got on the phone and said, by the way, Diane's been missing for four weeks. Okay, what else? That guy can cry on command. He cried to y'all too? Oh yeah. And Whenever you... we get into certain subjects and tough questions, it's like a tear was sitting on the edge of his eyelid ready to roll. And then he'd blink and there it goes. So the good thing about the crying even in front of y'all is that we specifically asked about daddy crying. Is your dad a crier? Not really. I think we could all agree he has pretty strategic tears. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. One of the things that obviously shook him up a lot, she left at 8 p.m. at night. And he said, no, she left between 6 and 7 in the morning. And I told him, HPD took a written statement from you, and you signed it, and you said 8 p.m. He said, then they're wrong. Then they're wrong. And I said, but how can they be wrong, Joe? I said, because that's your statement. But you know why else that's important? You're doing it analytically as a cop. As a prosecutor, you would go, okay, he says 8 o'clock. Then he goes six in the morning. So Don't you know day. the last time you saw your wife alive, you can picture everything. And he can't even get his the sun shining or the moon shining right. He looked into a PI, but it was going to be $50,000. And so he elected not to hire one. Who did you say he hired, Mr. Hosher? Uh, just some detectives or something. Okay, so he actually hired his own detectives. Looking at all this, how do you feel, confident or otherwise, as far as presenting it to Elton Mathis, your DA, to see if he'll move forward? It's circumstantial, which is new for Heather and I, but absolutely it's ready to go to a grand jury. 
Joe has told so many stories to so many people over the years that when you gather them all together and you add in the fact that he filed for a divorce just before taking out a life insurance policy on Diane's life that ultimately paid him $500,000. Not only can you eliminate the idea that Diane was killed in some random act of violence, you also have a strong circumstantial case against him for the murder of his wife, Diane. It's the really good detectives that can put together these cases. If you get a gun or a fingerprint or DNA that's confession, easy. that's easy. Right, that's and you should be very proud. I am proud. I am very proud. We have been investigating the murder of Diane Holster, who disappeared in 1986 and was found 11 years later. We have put together a good case against her husband, Joe Holster, which we are presenting to Elton Mathis, the district attorney of Waller County. Our hopes are that the DA is going to like the case as much as we do, but it is a circumstantial case with a lot of details and a long story to explain. So in the end, all you can do is present your case and hope that he wants to take it. I missed a blue memo. Well, we just got back from talking with Elton. He took it. He accepted it. He was very, very He was excited. Impressed. He was really? excited. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> he was excited. So, yes, it is awesome. That is. We have worked so hard. This is the best news that we could have ever had, and this is what it's all about. He said there was just way too many lies that Joe was telling. Are you excited? I am Great. truly excited. I, and I thank you guys for helping us do this and moving this forward. And I am extremely pleased with how this turned out. And I am so thankful. And I cannot wait to be able to tell Diane's family that we're moving forward on it. I think you're going to sit here. Oh, they did? Okay. <laughs> um, we have worked very hard on this, and we went and met with the DA earlier this morning to see if he would accept the case. And he said he would accept the case, and he is going to take it to a grand jury. I am happy. Yeah, that's pretty unbelievable. I, She's very happy. I'm, it's just overwhelming. I know, you know it is. It really is. I know it is. Come on, Heather, you gotta come hug her. I know. <laughs> <laughs> She's been waiting so hard to tell. I thought of Diane every day, prayed for her every night. <laughs> but I just never dreamed anything would happen, I don't think. I'm just thinking about the beautiful picture I have in my house. And she's still there. <laughs> I don't mean to cry. No, this is something good. I mean, this has been a lot of time that you've gone through kind of knowing but not 100% knowing what's going on, and now you're finally getting some answers. I just feel my daughter didn't need this. She really didn't. No, she didn't. Everyone respected your daughter, and they knew what a good woman that she was. We knew Heather cared. This wasn't just another job for her. She was so open and so compassionate. I almost feel like she's part of our family. Well, it was wonderful working on this case. It's even more wonderful that it turned out. And golly, to give y'all such a wonderful family this kind of news. Heather, we told Heather this is why she became a cop. For days like this. We and for families like you. I'm happy for a family. And uh, I'm sad that my dad's not here to hear all this and see what's happened. She had a good heart. Uh, she had a lot of compassion. And... Uh, she loved those kids, and, and we never saw that she would leave on her own. Thank you so much. You're very, very You're welcome. welcome. Thank you. If there's Thanks a trial, I'm going to be sitting on the front row with you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The thing is, with a case like this, and someone is allegedly missing, you just live your life not knowing what the hell to think. And they've been doing that for 28 years. And I hope that finally they're going to get the answers that they want and need because it's been long enough and they finally deserve some answers and justice.